hello lovelies in this video we're going to be going through the development of the atom so all of the different people that were involved and what they added to the model if you want some help remembering all of these bits then over on the website after this video you'll find a link to set of questions set of flashcards to help you go through everything and make sure you've got it in your mind for the exam also over there you'll find the predictive papers and the walkthroughs for the predictive papers and details of all the live small group of business sessions that we're running Development of the model of the atom. The model of the atom has changed many times in history. Here we're going to look at some of the main models and main suggestions for models and how we've developed those models over time, what changes have we made and where have those changes come from. The first model we'll look at is the billiard ball model. This was suggested by John Dalton in 1803. The next model we'll look at will be the plum pudding model. This was suggested in 1897. We then move into the 1900s with the Rutherford model next, which was suggested and proposed in 1909 to 1911. The Rutherford model was then adapted and added to by the Bohr model. This was done in 1913. Finally, we'll come to the nuclear model. This was developed partially by James Chadwick and by others, and this is still being adapted today. So it started in 1932, but it leads up to the current day. So let's take a closer look at the billiard ball model. The billiard ball model was suggested by John Dalton in 1803 and it's based on three main ideas. The first of these ideas is that all matter is made of atoms and that these atoms cannot be created, destroyed or divided. The second key idea is that all atoms of the same element must be identical. So this would mean that all carbon atoms are identical all oxygen atoms are identical. Within this idea, he also suggested that different elements would have different atoms. So an oxygen atom would be different to a carbon atom, which would be different to a hydrogen atom. The third idea proposed was that different atoms could join together to form a new substance. Although the billiard ball model is one of the most simple models, those ideas do still stand. And the fact that all matter is made of atoms is still deemed to be true. Atoms of the same element being identical and different elements being differentiated by their different atoms is still true. And that atoms combining to form new substances is also still true. The next model we're going to look at more closely is the plum pudding model. This was suggested by J.J. Thompson in 1897 and was based on the work done by John Dalton with some new features. A key update of the plum pudding model was the discovery of the electron. The electron was identified to be very, very small and negatively charged. The discovery of the electron also had a big impact on John Dalton's model, the billiard ball model, because this disproved the fact that atoms could not be divided because clearly they were made up of smaller subatomic particles, which in this case included the electron. So the plum pudding model was a new and updated model for the atom. It was updated based on new information and new facts that had been learned about the atom in the time between the billiard ball model and the plum pudding model. The main ideas included that there were tiny negatively charged particles called electrons that were spread out within soft, positively charged material. This is where the model gets its name because the electrons are acting as these plums and the soft positively charged material is acting as the pudding. So just as it's suggested the electrons are spread out within this soft positive material, plums are spread out within plum pudding. The plum pudding model builds on John Dalton's billiard ball model. Some themes are the same through both models where evidence hasn't allowed them to be updated. However, some themes are changed completely and this is because new evidence has been provided New experiments have been run and this has provided new information in order to update the model. The next step along the development of the atom was an experiment called the Rutherford scattering. This was run by Ernest Rutherford in 1909 and led to significant updates to the model of the atom. The Rutherford scattering experiment is sometimes known as the gold foil experiments. 
In this experiment, Ernest Rutherford shot a beam of positively charged alpha particles at a very thin sheet of gold metal foil. Ernest Rutherford made a prediction based on what he thought should happen if the plum pudding model of the atom was correct. He expected that all of the positively charged particles, alpha particles, would pass straight through the sheet of foil. So now let's look at what actually happened in this experiment. Some of those alpha particles, those positively charged particles, were deflected or they were scattered in different directions. They didn't pass straight through, they were bounced in different angles. A few of the particles rebounded completely, they were deflected back, bounced back towards the emitter of the alpha particles. These results were highly significant because neither of those outcomes supports the plum pudding model. This left Rutherford in a position where he needed to update the model in order to fit the outcomes of the experiment. This method of using experimental data to update and support models is still used now. It's how all scientific models are developed, enhanced and improved over time. Based on the outcome of the Rutherford scattering experiment, he came up with a new model. The first feature of the new model is that there is a nucleus in the centre of the atom that is positively charged. If you remember the plum pudding, that suggested that the electrons were dotted throughout just a general positively charged soft material. The next feature of the new model that Rutherford proposed was that the electrons actually orbit the nucleus on shells outside of the centre of the atom. Again, this is very different to the plum pudding model that had the electrons within the positive material dotted through like plums in a pudding. The final proposal of the new model was that most of the atom was empty space. What Rutherford meant by this was that there was quite a large gap between the nucleus that was positively charged and the electrons orbiting on those shells. Here you can see a diagram of the nuclear model. And in this, we can see the electrons orbiting the nucleus on these shells and this positively charged nucleus in the center. We can also see that example of empty space that Rutherford referenced in his new model, as it's not a plum pudding as the last one. It's not one solid mass. Instead, there is a positive nucleus, then quite a lot of empty space until you reach the shells that the electrons are housed on. The next big update to the model of the atom came from Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr suggested the Bohr model. Niels Bohr and the Bohr model contain some quite significant changes to the nuclear model. The first significant change is that the electrons are actually orbiting at different distances away from the nucleus. What he meant by that was that there was an inner shell, then one a little bit further away, then another one further away from that, and that they were at fixed positions, fixed distances from the nucleus. The next change he proposed was that the shells the electrons are housed on are actually also energy levels, so electrons on different shells also have different amounts of energy. By far the biggest change was the discovery of the proton. So now, rather than just this solid generic nucleus, we have protons. So in the updated model, we still have electrons orbiting the nucleus. However, we now have the electrons orbiting at different distances on these differently distant shells. This is different. These are concentric rings as opposed to all being the same distance from the nucleus. We still have that recognisable nucleus in the centre of the atom. However, now it's stated to contain positively charged protons. Although the diagram of the Bohr model doesn't look much different to the nuclear model, there are significant differences. The next big update came in the 1900s. This was from James Chadwick in 1932. The main update James Chadwick proposed included Experimental evidence for the existence of neutrons. Up until this point, neutrons have not been mentioned in the model of the atom, but in 1932, James Chadwick had experimental evidence that they did indeed exist. The next update to the model was that he had experimental evidence that neutrons he'd found in the nucleus. This was in addition to the fact that we already knew that protons were in the nucleus based off of the Rutherford experiment and the nuclear model, so now the nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons. 
Chadwick also had experimental evidence that suggested and supported the idea that the nucleus was the area of the atom with the most mass. Looking at this updated diagram of the nuclear model, we can still see the electrons at fixed distances from the nucleus orbiting on their shells. The key difference with this new model is that within the nucleus there are protons and neutrons separately. It, the nucleus is no longer just one solid circle, but instead defined as two separate subatomic particles, protons and neutrons. So let's look at the main takeaways of the development of the model of the atom. The first main takeaway is that models are often updated based on new evidence. Models are not updated randomly with new random theories coming out. They're based on evidence that has been generated that has led to the development or update of a model. The evidence used to update these models generally gets stronger over time. This is because technology tends to advance, which allows us to run more complicated experiments and work out more complicated updates. And finally, experimental data is the most useful form of data that we can use to update our models. This is because we can make predictions beforehand based on the previous model and how we think that model should behave in that given experiment. We can then accept update or reject the model based on that experiment's outcome and our prediction. This allows us to move forward with our models and is still the same method that we use now in developing scientific models and scientific theories. Ouch! This is why in some videos I explain scratches.